In the history of automotives, there's one engine that's incredibly unique and full of debate. The Wankel rotary engine. Created by German engineer Felix Wankel, this engine is remarkably simple. Its main part is just a triangle-shaped rotor that spins to generate power. In theory, this engine is perfect for a motorcycle because it's small, lightweight, powerful, and incredibly smooth. However, this idea emerged when the British motorcycle industry was in a slump. In the 1970s and 80s, British manufacturers were losing to Japanese bikes that were more powerful and reliable. In the midst of this tough situation, Norton, a legendary British brand, made a bold decision. Instead of following Japan's lead, they chose Wankel technology, hoping to leapfrog the competition and return to glory. The story of the Norton Wankel engine actually begins in Germany, not England. Its foundation was laid by a company called Hercules, which in 1974 became the first manufacturer to sell a rotary engine motorcycle to the public. The Hercules W2000, or DKW in the UK, was an experiment. Its engine was a 294 cubic centimeter single rotor, air-cooled unit, originally designed for a snowmobile, not a motorcycle. Though innovative, the bike had many flaws. It was heavy, expensive, and its power output of only about 27 to 32 horsepower was considered not worth the price. Ultimately, the bike was a market failure. However, there was a silver lining to this failure. The tooling to produce the Wankel engine was eventually bought by Norton, which became the starting point for their rotary project. Meanwhile in England, a BSA engineer named David Garside already saw great potential in the Wankel engine. He modified its intake system and managed to dramatically increase its power. Garside knew the main problem with the Wankel engine was excessive heat. His solution was a clever system called the plenum chamber. Here's how it worked. Fresh air was drawn in from the front of the bike, then channeled through the inside of the spinning rotor to cool the engine from within. This hot air was then collected in a large chamber the plenum chamber, which also served as part of the bike's frame before finally entering the carburetor. This process cooled the engine from the inside while also cooling the fuel mixture before combustion, making it more efficient. After BSA went bankrupt and merged with Norton, the development of Garside's Wankel engine continued. The result was the Norton Interpol 2P42 produced in 1984. This bike wasn't sold to the public, but was produced exclusively for the British police and highway patrol. The Interpol II used a 588 cubic centimeter twin rotor Wankel engine that produced 85 horsepower. This bike became a real world test bed for the new technology. This is where the plenum chamber system ran into trouble. This air cooling system was only effective if the bike was constantly moving at high speed. For a race bike, this isn't an issue, but for a police bike that often moves slowly or gets stuck in traffic, the airflow wasn't enough. As a result, the Interpol II became notorious for overheating in low-speed situations. This problem was compounded by other issues like rapid wear on the rotor tips and easily fouled spark plugs. Where they're launching their new police bike. It's called the Commander. It's powered by a twin chamber. To solve the overheating problem, Norton launched the Norton Commander in 1988. This model was a major turning point because it used a liquid cooling system radiator. The radiator completely solved the overheating issue and opened the door for more power. The Commander was made in two versions. The P-52 was a single seat version for the police, while the P-53 was a two seat touring version for the public, complete with a fairing and side cases. To cut costs and improve reliability, Norton used many components from other bikes especially the Yamaha XJ900, like the wheels, forks, and brakes. With 85 horsepower and a smooth ride, the Commander was a good touring bike, though its looks were considered unappealing. At the same time, another revolution was happening in a corner of the Norton factory. Brian Crichton, an engineer in the service department, saw hidden potential in the Wankel engine. 
While servicing the Interpol two police bikes, he believed the 85-horsepower engine could produce much more power. When Crichton proposed his idea to build a racing version, Norton's management rejected it. But Crichton didn't give up. He worked secretly in his spare time, using a small shed as his workshop. Taking an engine from a crashed police bike, he managed to boost its power to 120 horsepower. The turning point came in 1987. Crichton built a rough prototype and took it to a test track. There, his cobbled together bike hit an incredible speed of 170 miles per hour. This achievement shocked Norton's management, and they finally gave the green light for an official racing program. With a limited factory support, the first race bike, named the RC588, began to take shape. Initially, it still used an air-cooled engine. Crichton also knew the standard chassis was too heavy for racing. He ordered a lightweight and rigid aluminum twin-spar chassis from Spondon Engineering, a renowned chassis specialist. With riders like Trevor Nation and Simon Buckmaster, the prototype made its racing debut in late 1987 and immediately showed its potential, winning its second race. The next step was the introduction of the Norton RCW 588 in 1989. The W stood for water-cooled, signaling that the race team was now using a radiator system like the Commander. This boosted the engine's power to over 135 brake horsepower, on par with larger capacity Japanese bikes. Absolutely unbelievable power, but... At the same time, a major sponsor came on board from the tobacco company John Player & Sons, JPS. The Norton race bike was transformed. With its distinctive black and gold JPS livery, the bike instantly became an icon and elevated the team's image from a small outfit to a major force in the racing world. Crichton's success in boosting the Wankel engine's power was remarkable, considering how difficult it is to tune. Unlike a regular engine, he couldn't just swap out parts like camshafts or pistons to change the power. Instead, Crichton had to think like he was tuning a two-stroke engine. The power increase came from modifying the intake and exhaust ports on the rotor housing, as well as using special racing carburetors and exhaust systems. Terry Reimer, who leads these red second place. With a powerful bike, a great Spondon chassis, JPS sponsorship, and talented riders like Steve Spray, the 1989 season belonged to Norton. The RCW 588 dominated British circuits. Steve Spray won both the British Formula One and 750cc Super Cup championships. The team broke lap records at almost every circuit, beating bikes from much larger Japanese manufacturers. This victory was a source of pride for the British motorcycle industry. To celebrate their success on the track, Norton launched the Norton F1 P55 in 1990. This was a street legal version of their race bike allowing fans to own a piece of history. Produced in very limited numbers, only about 140 units, the F1 was an exotic and expensive machine. Visually, the F1 was a replica of the RCW 588, complete with the iconic black and gold JPS livery. The bike used a Spondon aluminum chassis, advanced suspension from white power, WP, and Brembo brakes. Its engine was a street version of the 588 cubic centimeter liquid-cooled Wankel, producing 95 horsepower, paired with a five-speed gearbox from a Yamaha FZR 1000. However, due to its fully enclosed bodywork, the F1 once again suffered from overheating issues in traffic, an irony considering this problem was supposed to have been solved by liquid cooling. This showed just how difficult it was to tame the heat of a Wankel engine. The third generation was Norton's peak of glory, but it also held the seeds of future challenges. Instead of unity, the team split. Norton's management appointed Barry Simmons, a former Honda race team manager, as the new race team manager in early 1990. This created a conflict with Brian Crichton, the architect of the team's success. Crichton was an engineer who had built the bike from the ground up, while Simmons came with methods from large factory teams. The conflict came to a head when Simmons decided to switch tire suppliers from Dunlop to Michelin. For Crichton, this was a disaster. The entire chassis and suspension development over the years was based on Dunlop tires. Switching to Michelin meant all that data was useless. Feeling unappreciated, Crichton resigned in September 1990. 
Meanwhile, the Factory Norton team continued under Simmons' direction, with writers like Ron Haslam and Robert Dunlop. Crichton's departure didn't end his work. He founded an independent team called Roton, a combination of Rotary and Crichton. Using a Norton F1 engine, he began building his own version of the race bike, free from management interference. He hired Steve Spray, the hero of the 1989 season, who had just been fired by Norton as his rider. After dominating in the UK, Norton set its sights on the GP500 World Championship. This was made possible after the FYM, the world racing body, allowed the 588 cubic centimeter Wankel engine to compete in the premier class in 1990. For Brian Crichton, this was his ultimate goal, to challenge the Japanese giants like Honda, Yamaha, and Suzuki on the world circuits. The result of this split was predictable. The grand ambition for GP500 never materialized. Crichton's Roten team was always short on funds and struggled to compete. The factory Norton team, despite some good results in the UK, could never replicate the success of 1989. Without Crichton's understanding of the engine, they fell behind the Japanese manufacturers. For the 1992 and 1993 seasons, the Norton team introduced their final bike, the NRS 588. This bike was a further development of the RCW 588. The main change was a new aluminum twin spar chassis designed by Ron Williams and built by Harris Performance. It also featured updated WP suspension, a six speed gearbox, and larger carburetors. The power remained over 135 brake horsepower, making it a very strong machine. The NRS 588 was Norton's last gamble to stay competitive. Destiny had other plans. The talented Scottish rider Steve Hislop suddenly found himself without a bike for the 1992 Isle of Man TT after parting ways with his Yamaha team. In a last-minute deal, Hislop agreed to ride the NRS 588. The bike was painted white with Hislop's personal sponsor, Abus, instead of the usual black and gold JPS colors. What happened next became legendary. In the senior TT race, considered the greatest TT race of all time, Hislop battled fiercely for six laps against his rival, Carl Fogarty, on a Yamaha. They swapped the lead, never more than a few seconds apart. Hislop had to wrestle with a bike that was unstable, thirsty for fuel, and prone to overheating. On the final lap, Fogarty set a new lap record, but it wasn't enough. Hislop brought the Norton home to win by just 4.4 seconds. It was Norton's first victory in the senior TT since 1961, a win that shook the racing world. However, Hislop's heroic victory was just a brief flash of light. On the short British superbike circuits, Norton was falling further behind the constantly developing Japanese manufacturers. The bigger problem was financial. Norton's parent company was in a severe crisis in the early 1990s. Mismanagement led investors to pull out, and the company ran out of money. In this climate, funding an expensive race team was impossible. Hislop's victory wasn't a sign of a comeback. It was a glorious farewell. After the 1993 season, the Norton Wankel factory racing program was officially shut down due to lack of funds. After his underfunded Roten team folded, Brian Crichton returned to British domestic racing. In 1992, he teamed up with racing legend Colin Seeley and secured sponsorship from the oil company Duckham's. His team was reborn as Crichton Norton. It was a classic comeback story. A brilliant engineer, once pushed out, now back with a lean private team, ready to challenge the bigger teams. The peak of Crichton's comeback came in the 1994 British Superbike season. With a young Scottish rider, Ian Simpson, the Crichton-Norton team did the impossible. Against better-funded factory teams from Ducati and Kawasaki, Simpson won the 1994 British Superbike Championship. However, this incredible success also brought back the inherent problems of the Wankel engine. Safety was the main concern. The Wankel engine produces extreme heat exhaust temperatures could reach 1,200 degrees Celsius. 
which created a fire risk. Additionally, its lubrication system meant the engine sprayed unburnt oil out of its exhaust. The combination of a super hot exhaust and oil spray could be dangerous on the track. Crichton's 1994 victory was, ironically, the final nail in the coffin for the Wankel engine in superbike racing. The governing body, the FIM, was now under pressure to do something about this rotary anomaly. First, there was the ongoing issue of engine capacity rules. There was never a fair way to compare the 588 cubic centimeter Wankel engine to a 750 cubic centimeter, or 1,000 cubic centimeter piston engine. Second, there was political pressure. Other manufacturers like Ducati and Kawasaki, who had invested millions in their piston engines, didn't like losing to a small private team with weird technology. Finally, safety concerns provided the perfect public reason for the FIM to act. As a result, after the 1994 season, the rules were changed, effectively banning rotary engines from superbike competition. The Wankel racing era was over. It wasn't beaten on the track, it was regulated out of existence. <laughs>